Uh, we, we are starting, we are starting our summer Sunday school. Um, and again, you, you, I asked you and you put in a bunch of names of kind of classic Sunday school stories, right? Uh, and of course, like creation story is always one of them. So we're going to start with that one today. Um, we're going to cover, we've got Tower of Babel, we've got Noah's, Noah in the Ark, obviously, that's always a classic. Uh, what else do we got? I know Jesus walks on the water is one. I think Jesus feeds the 5,000. I'm trying to remember. Um, Abraham and Isaac, I believe, was in there. We got a whole list of them. Kind of your, your classic Sunday school score, stories. And so we're just going to kind of go through those again. They, these are stories that we all kind of grew up with. I, I imagine. If you, grew up in, if you grew up in church, if you grew up in Sunday school, uh, then, then for sure this is the way you grew up with. So this morning we'll start with, uh, yeah, this morning and then next week we're going to look at Noah. I figured they're sort of at the beginning we'll, we'll go in some sort of order, but there's no real order to it, because as, especially as we're away on holidays and different guest speakers come, uh, they're going to be speaking kind of out of order. So it, thankfully, it doesn't have to be in order. These stories don't have to go in order. But since this is the beginning of it, we figured we would start with Genesis. We, we, we would start with this. And so we're going to look at Genesis this morning. Uh, we're going to look at this story. And of course, you know, most of your Bibles, not all of them will say in the beginning. Um, I didn't know this, but there's all sorts of debate about whether that's the proper way to say it. To say in the beginning is actually not the proper way to say it, but it's kind of a weird way to say it. So most people kind of just say when God began to create. There's different ways. Your Bibles may say different things. Um, but the idea is still there, right? The idea is still there. When God began to create heaven and earth is how it starts off, right? Uh, right? The earth was formless. It's empty. The darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. Now, this is a great story, and as we go into this, there's three things that come up in this story, which basically is the whole story of Christianity. It's the whole story of the Bible, and it's here in the very first three chapters of the... We're not going to read all three chapters, not, not fully. Uh, that, would, that would take a bit. Uh, but there's three stories here, and, and it really, this is what it's all about. And so I said that, you know, the first story is about the image, the second story is the incident, and the third story is the invitation. Um, and as we get into this, real quick off the bat is, uh, the one thing is that we're not going to talk about, because honestly, you could debate this endlessly, is, is the how, right? Like, how old is the world? Who grew up with, like, if you don't believe in 6,000-year-old earth, you know, you don't believe in Jesus? I got told that probably as an adult a couple times, um, which is fine. I've been to seminary. I looked down on that. No, I didn't. I just, I'm just kidding. I don't look down on anybody. I just, but it doesn't matter. That's not what this story is about. That's not what it's about. And I know growing up, we kind of got hung up on that. Um, but there are wonderful Christians who believe it's 6,000-year-old earth. There's wonderful Christians who believe in theistic evolution. Uh, it, I encourage you to read widely. Uh, it's really interesting. It's fascinating. Uh, go for it. Um, you know, uh, BioLogos is an interesting one. Guys like Francis Collins, he writes for them. Uh, Tim Keller used to write for them. Uh, N.T. Wright writes for them. And so there's all sorts of, you know, anyways, that's not what it's about. It's interesting, it's fascinating, I encourage you to read about it and study and all those good things, but that's not what the story's about. It's not what the story's about because the people who are writing this story, they're not scientists, they don't care how old the earth is, right? They don't care. It's not what they're concerned about. They're not even concerned about the how. They're concerned about the why, right? Their, their only concern in this is, is why are we here? What is our purpose? Um, and again, if... This Genesis story, our, our creation story, there's a number of creation stories that around kind of, you know, the ancient Near East, as they say. And they're all fairly similar, right? Some of them are, are really similar. But there's, it's, it's not in what's similar, it's actually in what is different uh, between those accounts and between the Genesis account that actually makes the entire difference to the creation story. And so if you probably know the story, right? And we're not going to read through it all, but... And again, there's kind of two stories. One's all about the order. The other one's more about God's relationship with us, right? And the first one... It, there's no talking with us. And the second one, it's all about God hanging out with people. And in both of these stories, you get this, this really wonderful picture of God. And so, um, but the, 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 it's the details, like I said, with the details in our story, in the Genesis story, that really stand out. And again, for anybody reading this story, because they would have known all the other ancient Near Eastern creation stories, as they heard it, it's what was different that would blow your mind. Again, to us, it's not because we didn't clearly grow up thousands of years ago uh, in that culture. It's hard for us to really understand. But, but here, so here it is. So now again, every creation story is somewhat similar. Uh, you're, always, you're always made out of mud, right? First of all, the, there's always the gods. It's always created by whichever god that group believed in. Uh, there was never any doubt about that. So their God created it. Sometimes, you know, they ripped apart monsters, created the world. They did all these different things. However, the world, the earth came to be. But then it was about the people, right? And so in, in every story that is similar to Genesis, but not the Genesis story, in every single one of those stories, 
Uh, the people are made out of mud, but then they're made, they're mixed with something. Like they're mixed with something. And then the something is, it's, you mix it with sweat, you mix with saliva, or you mix it with semen. And, and the point of that is to give you your value and your worth. That's the point of, of being mixed with one of those three things. Because the gods created humans and all these different stories to work for them. Basically, the gods didn't want to do any dirty work. They looked around the earth and goes, well, someone's got to take care of this. We don't want to do this. Uh, we don't want to do the dirty work. We're much too lazy, right? Kind of like the Greek gods. They're always very lazy. Uh, and so they want to create humans basically to be servants and to be slaves. And then as they create them, they give them these different properties. And once you're mixed with that, whatever you're mixed with, that is now your value. That is now your purpose. That is now your work. You can't rise above that. That's how you were created. And that's every story. That's every story. And what's amazing then about Genesis is Genesis, God comes in and he takes the mud, right? And so you, if you're reading the story, you go, oh, this, this, yeah, I know this story. But then what does he do, right? What does God do? Right? He doesn't mix you with one of those three things to give you, what, what is the thing? And this is the thing that would, blow, it doesn't blow our minds because we don't live in that culture. But to hear this, right, it, what does it say? It says that God what? Right? God breathed, he, he breathed his own breath, Right? And if you were reading this and you were used to all these other stories and all of a sudden you read this and you go, the, the, the what now? Right? That's the very breath of God himself. Right? And, and that's, like, that's ridiculous. Nobody does that. Nobody does that. Because when they create you, they create you lower so that you stay there and you have your role. But then to, as God himself gives you his very breath, what is he saying? He says, my breath is now in you. And again, for us, we're so used to it, it's hard to actually kind of realize. But, but it's just, it's amazing. It's amazing. And think about what that says about your value, right? In all these creation stories, you know, the sweat or the saliva or whatever it was, it gives you your value, it gives you your purpose, but then to have the very breath of God in you. Think about how people would all of a sudden look at the Hebrew people and say, whoa, your God is totally different, and your God values you so much more than whatever God that I've, I've been believing in, and whatever, you know, I grew up with. And then it's just this ridiculous thing, right? the very breath of God, the very breath of God. But then God, and, and, and he goes on to say something else, right? It's not just that he fills him with his breath, but he says, let's make, right? Let's make people in our image. Let's make them in our image. Now, to be an image bearer, right, in those days, they understood this, right, is the king. You, whatever kingdom you were part of, an image bearer was someone who represented your kingdom, someone who went out into other parts, and they represented your kingdom. They were your image bearer. They had power. They had glory that belonged to you and to your kingdom, and it was given to them, right? Like an ambassador today, right? I'm an ambassador for Canada over in wherever, right? You have, you represent Canada. So he gives them his breath, and then he creates them in his image, as you are now my image bearers in the world. And again, if you're from one of these outside nations reading this story, you're just like, holy cow, man, like this is nuts. Like the value and the worth and your creation story is, is so, so, is so deep and it's so rich, but the value of the person themselves is just beyond anything they could imagine. That God himself not only gives you his breath, but makes you an image bearer, stamps his image on you. He stamps it on you, and then he sends you into the world. He sends you into the world. And what did we do when we were there, right? What did he say? Okay, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make these people. I'm gonna give them my my breath. I'm gonna give them my very spirit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give them my image. And then what does he do? He puts us into the garden, right? What does he say? He says, "Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us." And they will reign over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth and all the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. And then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over it, over the fish, the birds, the sky, all the animals that scurry along the ground. And this is what he does. So not only does he give us his own spirit, not only does he create us in his image, then he says, this world that I've created, I want you to go, and I want you not to work for me like a slave or a servant. I want you to go and work with me. This is my creation. I want you to work with me to what? To tend it, right? To be stewards of it. I don't know if you know these guys. They spoke here a couple years ago. This is Aroka, or Arosha, I, I say Aroka. They're a local group, Canadian, uh, Canadian thing, and it's, it's Christians who, who want to be good stewards of God's world. Right? Just not far down the road, Highway 8. Right? We are called to what? To steward creation. We're called to reign over and to take care of. God says, right, and the story of, of creation, right, God takes the chaos, right, his spirit hovers over the chaos, over the waters, and then he takes it and he divides the waters, and then he's got the land, and then he starts dividing the land, and then the light and the day and the, all the different animals, right, and he takes the chaos and then he organizes it all, right? It's actually less a creation story and much more an organization story. 
And he organizes it all, and he separates everything. And then he says to us, I'm now putting you into this place. I'm putting you into... And, and again, one of the pictures is, is if you read through you know, how they built the temple, it's the six stages of building the temple. And the final piece is the way you put... Who do you put into the temple? You put the priests and the priestess. Right? You put them into this, this place, and they what? They stand between humanity and God. You put them into the Holy of Holies. And the Garden of Eden is like the Holy of Holies. And so he builds this, he builds it all, he builds this perfect place, and then right in the center of it, where he is, where God is, he takes these humans and he puts them there. And he says, you're going to work not for me, but with me. You're going to work with me. And you're going to tend this. And everything that I've, I've, I've now organized, you're going to help keep it organized. You're going to take the wildness of this garden and you're going to keep it organized. And you're going to do this, you're going to reign over it, you're going to tend it, you're going to steward it, why, for the good of everybody. And he gives us our purpose. He gives us his image, he gives us his breath, and he gives us his purpose to tend his creation, to work with him, to be his, right, his priests, of, to stand between them and the world, to take what God wills for the world, God's will for the world, and to make it happen here. This is how he places it. This is, what, this is our purpose, is to take the will of God for his world, to act it out, and to help people understand that, and to keep this thing going. What an amazing call that is, right? What an amazing role that is. This is our, this is our image-bearing role and purpose that God has given us. We don't want it to fall back into what, right? When God took the waters of chaos and he, and he, and he made everything perfect, our role is to, what? is to help that chaos, to keep it at bay so it doesn't come back in. But he gives us one warning. He says one warning, right? He says, all this stuff is yours. Everything's great. And we have this amazing, like, this amazing relationship. And, and it's this intimacy, right? This intimacy. Again, in all the other creation accounts, the gods are always up here. But God, what does he do? He walks in the garden with them. He hangs out with them. And they're nude, right? Like, like that, you know, I don't think that's a fact that they just threw in for the fun of it. I think they're trying to make the point, right? Like the intimacy that they have with God. Here in this place, in this holy of holies, you don't get closer to God than that. No, no other story has that. You're like, you, you walk and you talk with God. That doesn't happen in other stories. And so, if, again, if you're reading this story for the first time, you're just like, man, this is amazing. Your God is amazing. And so we, this is what we do. This is what we're called to. And we had it all, but God said one thing, right? He said, you got these two trees, the tree of life and the tree of good and evil, right? And it's actually, he says, the lay place it in the garden. He says, you tend it, you watch over it. But he gave him the warning, you may freely eat, uh, freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Right? And that's what he says. And so they go about, they do their stuff, they're naming animals, they're having a good time. And then along comes what? Along comes the serpent. Right? Along comes this snake. Again, but it wasn't a snake like we know. Apparently it had legs, right? But it, it doesn't matter what kind of animal. The point is it's, it's, it represents chaos. It's literally the chaos. If you look at Revelation, it's the same thing. The serpent, the dragon, the serpent. It represents chaos, and chaos enters into this perfection. And what does he say? He says to Adam and Eve, he goes, did God really say you're going to die, right? And Eve kind of gets it wrong. She goes, oh, yeah, no, he said this. And she actually takes it further than God did. And he goes, are you sure? He goes, because here's what's really going to happen. He goes, as soon as you eat this tree, you're going to have knowledge. Your eyes are going to be opened. He goes, you're going to have the same knowledge that God has. You're going to be on par with God. And he made it sound really good. And he let them know that they weren't actually going to die. And he offers this thing, right? And, and what does he sound? Have you ever seen this movie? Right? right? I think they stole this from the Bible. When a snake comes along and he says, just trust me. Right? Trust me. God said, will you trust me and will you not do this? Will you be the people who, who, who do my will here on earth? And then along comes this, you know, this snake and he says, will you trust me? And they do trust him. And what did they really trust in? It wasn't so much him, right? But they trusted in their own will, right? Just like Frank Sinatra. God said, will you do my will? And the snake says, actually, you can do your own will. God says, will you, will you work with me for my purposes to be done here on the earth? And what they're offered is, actually, you can do your own will, right? You don't have, God is not the king who you work with for his kingdom, but you can have your own kingdom. You can be the king of your own kingdom. You can be the captain of your own fate. And they say, yeah, this is what we want, right? This is what we want. This is the way that we want to go. And so they take the fruit, they eat the fruit, and instantly what happens? They recognize something. It's true, their eyes are open. But it's open to, to the fact that something is now different, that something is wrong. And again, they go and they hide. And God comes along as he's still hanging out with them. 
And he's like, why are you guys hiding? You've never hidden before. And they're like, well, we were naked, right? Didn't care about that before. And it's, you understand that something has changed. And they've lost this intimacy with God because they no longer want to be seen naked before God, right? And again, that's just the sense of this loss of what has been broken, this trust that they had. The thing that they were set out to do and they recognize, and, and it's, it's gone, and it's just, it's gone. And God had said, if you eat of this, the, the, you know, if you eat of this fruit, you're going to die. But they don't die, do they? And they? You know, I don't know if they're thinking, hey, we didn't die. But they are going to die, right? Because what happens next? God says, okay, now that you've eaten of this, now that you've decided to be the captains of your own fate, now you've decided to, to work out your own will, to do what you want to see done. He says, now you can't reach out, you can't take from the tree of life anymore. So he escorts them out of the garden. So God wasn't lying. He said, when you eat of this fruit, surely you will die. Because in the garden, they had access to it. With the relationship with God, with that intimacy with God, they had access to eternal life. They had access to eternal life. They had it right there. And they could eat of it. You could eat of that all you want. He said, just don't eat of this one tree. And they went and ate of that one tree. And then that sin entered into the world. Right? The sin of not doing God's will, but doing our own will. God, I know what you want, but actually I want to do what I want to do. Right? When people say sin, it's missing the mark. It's missing the mark of doing what God has asked us to do. It's missing the mark of living out God's will for our world. What does the Bible say? It says the wages of sin is what? It's death. The wages of sin is death, and this is what everybody faced. After this moment, all people now, we had this relationship, we had this ability to be with God forever, but now what? Now we just live out our life, and then we face death. And if you read through the Psalms, and they talk about Sheol, and nobody looks forward to it, it's just this place you go to, and, and like your body's in the grave, but your soul's in Sheol, and you're just gone. Right? They go, I'll go be with my forefathers, but there's nothing there. I can't praise you. There's no presence of God there. This is all they have to look forward to. The wages of sin is death. When we decide to live for ourselves and not for God, the only future we truly have is death. But as Paul says, and I know it says anonymous underneath, I think AI is getting worse. Yeah. Right? But the gift of God is everlasting life in Christ Jesus. And we'll get to that in just a second of where this comes from. So what does God do? God says, you know, he's talking with the angels like, well, they can't reach out and take from the tree of life anymore. Right? I'm guessing you had to just keep eating from it. He says they can't keep doing that. So what does he do? Kicks him out, and what does he put in his place? Remember what they put in his place? Right, what do they put across the door into the garden? Right, remember it's big angel, flaming sword? Right? I don't know if there's an actual angel with a flaming sword, but they're very much giving a picture. What? You're not making it back. This way is very much closed. There is no way that you on your own are ever going to make it past here because surely you will die, right? And again, we have that picture of the Holy of Holies. What do we have in the Holy of Holies, right? It's cut off. The presence of God is now cut off from you. And if you enter that, right, the priest could only enter once a year, and if he did it wrong, they tied a rope around him. In case he died, they had to yank out his body. It's that same picture. There is nothing that you can do to get back now. There's nothing that you can do. I told you that surely death would be the result of this, and they did it anyways. They trusted in themselves. And unlike Jesus, what did they say? They said, not your will, but mine. Not your will, but mine. And death is what we reap because of it. This is where we are. Right? This is what we have. And God says, you can't live forever. And so he banishes them. Now, he's still with Adam and Eve. He still talks to them. He still hangs out with them. If you continue to read... After they're outside the garden, God hasn't abandoned them. But they have no access to eternal life anymore. They have no access to the same kind of intimacy that they had before. And there's no way we're making it back on our own. And this is where it gets interesting because we had the image of God, our purpose. Then we had the incident with the snake in the garden. But then we get the invitation. Right? So after God comes back into the garden... And they're talking with each other, and you know, he says, well, who told you you were naked? And she's like, well, the snake told us. And you know, who told you to eat the fruit? Well, the snake told me. I didn't put it in here. You know that meme where it's Spider-Man, they're all Spider-Man pointing at each other? I meant to put that in. Just picture it in your head. It's brilliant. Because she's like, oh, it's the snake. And, you know, and then, or no, yeah, Adam's like, oh, it was her. And she's like, it was the snake. And everybody's pointing at each other. It wasn't me. It was him. It was her. It was, they all did this. 
So God talks to each of them. But here's the invitation. Because this has just happened. This is the first time that God has talked to them. And it's, it's weird to think about, because I would have got a little bit mad. No, anybody? Right? Like, I would have stomped around a bit. I probably would have yelled a little bit. But when God's talking to them, what does he say? Right away. Now he doesn't wait for a bit. He says, okay, then the Lord said to the serpent. Right? He talks to Eve. He talks to Adam. Then he talks to the serpent. He says, because you've done this, because you are cursed more than all the animals, domestic and wild. Is this why we all hate snakes? You will crawl on your belly, right, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. But then here it is. He says, and he will strike your head, right? but you will strike his heel. He will strike your head. He will crush your head. Right? Some say strike, some say crush. He will crush your head, but you will strike his heel. What does he say? He says two things. First of all, he goes, for the rest of eternity, there's going to be the, your descendants and the snake's descendants and Eve's descendants. And again, not actual snake descendants. We don't fight snakes, right? But between good and evil. Or is it? No, it's not snakes. I'm just kidding. Right? There's this, like as Paul says, right? We're not fighting against flesh and blood, right? Not against enemies, but against evil, against rulers, against authorities, the unseen world. He says, this is going to be the hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, between those who follow God and those who don't between those who do the will of God and those who don't. But there's going to come this moment in the last verse, right, where he says, but he, right, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And this is one of my favorite pictures of all time. I love this picture, right? And I've shown this before. But I love this. I, I, it's almost a bit subtle. You may not notice, but you see Mary stepping on the snake's head, right? Like, I don't know if you missed that or not. It's, it's not that easy to see. But I love this photo. Of, you have this picture of Eve, and there's the snake. And then and it's almost like Mary's like not noticing she's doing it, but at the same time you know she's doing it on purpose, right? That she's crushing the snake's head. And I love this photo because it's, it's the beginning and, and it's the redemption at the same time. It's the fall and the sin, but at the same time the redemption of God. And so right away, right after this happened, God says, okay, here's what's going to happen, but just so you know, I'm not going to let this go. I'm not going to let this continue forever. In fact, this is going to come to a head and it's going to come to an end and one day, what does he say? He says, you will be back. We will have that intimacy again. The Holy of Holies will be opening it. This is why when Jesus dies on the cross, what happens, right? The curtain in the Holy of Holies, what happens? It rips open. It rips open. That's such an amazing symbol. You're like, well, that's weird, <laughs> right? No, no, it's the point behind it. That there is nothing holding us back anymore. Because when we sin, God says, okay, you have no more access to eternal life. You can't do this on your own. Then right away, he says, I'm going to do something. Yes, there's going to be hostility. Yes, all these things. Yes, the snake will strike your heel, but he will, he will crush the head. He will crush the head. And this is the best part, because what is this? This is the gospel. This is the good news of the gospel. Guys, you're living in sin, and death is a result of that. But don't worry, because I'm going to bring life. This will not go on forever. And literally, the rest of the Bible is what? It's this story. It starts with Abraham. God picks Abraham for no other reason than God chose Abraham. And what is the point of Abraham? What is it? He becomes the people of Israel. And the people of Israel is God's representative that says, hey, this is who I am. This is what it means to be the people of God. And they try really hard and they just keep failing and to the point where God himself says, well, clearly it's not going to happen through people. Right? So what happens? Well, God himself comes. Right? The only way it's going to happen is through, is through this. It's through the cross and it's through the resurrection. And there's no way we're walking past the flaming sword on our own. He says, I'm going to have to do it. And he promises it right off the hop. As soon as we sin, God says, okay, here's what's going to happen because sin is in the world. Yes, you're going to face death and you're going to face all sorts of stuff in your life, but just know, I'm not abandoning you. I've not forgotten you. But life will be yours. So he does what nobody guessed, and here's the crazy part, right? Again, not only is the creation story mind-blowing to people around, but, but then the story of the gospel is also mind-blowing to people because God's never talked to people. God's never visit people. But what happens in, in, you know, what does John tell us? Right? John tells us what? He says, the word, the God himself became flesh and he came and he lived with us. And he took on human form to, to what? To get to know us and to tell us who he is and to tell us that this, and this is the way if you follow me once again, you will find life. And so what does he do, right? He enters creation. He gives his own life. Why? To offer us what? What is the gift that he offers us? Right? I will set you free from sin. What is the wages of sin? It's death. So I'm going to conquer sin because I'm going to conquer death. Death has no more hold over you. What is the gift that he offers us? What does Paul say? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? It's eternal life. So once again, that fruit that we could not grab onto anymore because of sin, he says, now it is yours. 
when you find forgiveness in me, when you, when you understand what I did on the cross, how I defeat sin and how I defeat death at the resurrection, he says, eternal life is yours again. The curtain is open. The Holy of Holies is open. We can have this intimate relationship with God once again. So he defeats sin. He conquers death. There's nothing keeping us from each other. And that's why Jesus says, listen, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send you what? What am I sending you? My Holy Spirit. Why? It's a recreation. He said, I'm going to send you my spirit. What does he say to Nicodemus? He says, listen, when you understand what I did, we come to faith. It, you are what? You are born again. You are a new creation. The old is gone, and my spirit is now with you. Why? Because we're going back. I mean, we're moving forward towards the city, but we're going back to how it was supposed to be. Which means that when we give our life to Christ, when we, when we follow him in faith, what are we doing? Right? We're taking up our image-bearing purpose once again. He says, I'm giving you the breath of God again. The very Spirit of God is going to live in you. And you're going to go back out in the world to what? To live out your purpose once again, to be my image bearers, to be my ambassadors, right? What does he say? He says, we are citizens. Our citizenship is in heaven. This is who we are now. And we're still awaiting our Savior. And then he goes even further. He says, listen, because you are ambassadors. Right? Dietrich Bonhoeffer didn't say this, by the way. I mean, he might have quoted it, but... He says, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We, as the people of God, the image bearers, we get to go what? Into the world. We get to once again be the priest standing between God and the world. And what are we trying to do? We're trying to reconcile. We're trying to draw people back to God. This is who God is. This is where we find eternal life. And not like in the other creation stories where you're distanced from God. No, this God wants to know you. This God will give you his very spirit, his very breath to fill you. And part of our role is to reconcile, to bring people back to God. And you see in this, in this I mean, it's three chapters long, and yet we have the entire story of the Bible. We have our, our, our creation and our purpose. We have the fall. But then we have this promise of redemption already. We have this promise of what is actually going to happen, and that all this will end one day when evil is crushed when his head is crushed. And what happens then? Then we find life again. We find life again. We have access to God again, to have an intimate relationship with him once again. The whole thing is there in those first three chapters, and the rest of the Bible is just how it unfolds, what it looks like. They didn't know. We, we have the pleasure of having the whole Bible. They didn't know. They had to work through this all. They go, well, we have this promise from God that this is all going to end one day. I don't know what that's going to look like, Again, most of them thought it was going to end with some sort of war where they, you know, they go to battle and they win. But then God comes and says, no, I'm going to give my life. It's through my own self sacrifice It's through giving of my life that you are going to find life. Because of that, he says, this is who you now are once again as my image bears. So we get to stand again as priests, as stewards, right, of this world of creation for the good of all people. Right? Again, what are we doing? We're bringing order back to the chaos, Right? I mean, last week we look at, at Noah, the story of Noah. What is the story of Noah? It's of the chaos, of the waters coming back over God's good creation. But now that we're here as people of faith, as Christians, well, part of our goal is to what? Is to keep the chaos, to keep the evil at bay. As Paul says, we're not fighting against other people. We're fighting against what is behind that, the evil of this world. And we keep chaos at bay. We keep, and so we, you know, we come to bring light. We come to do good things, right? When we feed the homeless, when we clothe the naked, as Jesus calls us to, he says, these are the things you're doing for me. These are things you're doing in my name. This is, this is you as my ambassadors, as my image bearers, pushing back, literally pushing back the darkness. This is part of who we are. We bring light into the dark. We bring hope into despair. And we bring love into a world of loneliness and pain. Again, just last, was it last year or a few months ago, right? I think down in the States, whoever their medical person is, right? I think even the World Health Organization has declared loneliness an epidemic, an actual medical ec epidemic. There's so many lonely people. And as people of faith, as, as, as Christians, we get to go and we get to take love and we get to bring friendship, we get to bring community to a world which is full of so, many, so much brokenness, so much pain, so much loneliness. We get to reconcile. We get to bring people. We get to take God to the people, and then we get to bring people back to God. That's all here. Right? With our image, the incident, but then also the invitation to, to join God once again in what he's doing. And this is, this is the story. This is, and the rest of it, now you know the story, by the way. That's it. The rest of it's just filler on how God does that. 
on what it looks like for his people, for Israel, what it looks like when Jesus comes, and what it looks like when, when, the, when, the, when the early church, these Jews and Gentiles coming to faith, and they begin to understand what this actually means. It's not about war. It's not about military. It's about us being changed from the inside out. Right? It's about us going into the world filled with the very Spirit of God as new creations, as image bearers. What does this look like? What does this look like? And the rest of our story, the rest of however many years we have left, this is what we now do. This is what we are now called to do. His image bears here. Pushing back the chaos, pushing back the darkness, trying to reconcile, bring people back into this relationship with God so that they too will find eternal life with God. That is our, that is our purpose. This is what we are doing here. And what a wonderful purpose that is to be a part of this amazing story which has spanned thousands of years and we still get to play a role in it. It didn't happen before us and we just get to know and we're still a part of this. This part of this story has still yet to be completed as we wait, right? As we wait for the return of God, as we wait for Christ to return. So we wait for that and everybody I know, it's going to be my generation because that's just how we think, right? Clearly all of the world has led up to me and my generation. Right? 1980s, yeah, no, all right. I don't know, it could be another 2,000 years. I don't think God thinks in, in terms of time. I don't know how long it's going to be, but we get to be a part of that. But all we need to know is whatever that comes, right? whenever that comes, we have our role here. And this is our, our, our joy in being the image bearers of God. What does that, what is that I mean? To think, I want you to think about that, not right now, but just think about that. As you, as you get up every day, as you go about your daily, what does it mean to be the image bearer? What does it mean to be his ambassador here in this world? What does that look like? What does that mean for your neighborhood and for your workplace and for your family and for this country? All these different things. There's no small purpose that we were created with and it's no small purpose that we were redeemed with. And, you know, it's not like a heavy weight, I'm going to put this weight on you, but just that's what drives us, that's what makes us, you know, as we go about all the daily stuff, just trying to make money and pay bills, and we do those things, we have to do those things. But in the midst of that, to remind ourselves that not only did God create us with this purpose, but he redeemed us and gave us back that purpose. What a wonderful thing that is. And we look at so many people, not just lonely, but people feel like they have no purpose, like they have no value in this world. There's so many people who struggle with that. I have no purpose. And we get to be the people that get to speak that in their lives. Actually, God has a wonderful purpose for you. God has created you and redeemed you to be a part of this huge story. And that's what we get to do. We get to tell that story with our words and with our lives. This is who we are. This is what we get to do. And so, um, but that's, that's, you know, very nutshell. I mean, we could have done six or seven sermons just on the creation story alone. But in a nutshell, that's the creation story. That's the whole story of, of, of everything in those first three chapters. And then we're still living out that, this story. And so I want you to think about those things, our, our image, think about the incident, but also think about the invitation that God gives to us now, this invitation he invites us into and calls us to. And now we're going to pray, and then we'll take our communion. We say, Lord, we thank you again for this story that reminds us of who we truly are. But so much we focus on, on, on sin and the fall and, 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 what, and the image, but Lord, our image was created before that. And Lord, we still struggle with sin, and we always will. Lord, you stamped your very image on us. Lord, you breathed your very breath into us. Our value and our worth, Lord, despite everything we do or say, our value comes from you because you loved us and you created us. That is who we are. And you loved us so much, Lord, that you did not abandon us, but you actually redeemed us so we could once again live out that purpose and live out that image-bearing role that you've, you've given to us. And whatever we're struggling with in this world, but may we remember that. Our purpose is not found in our jobs or in our families or in our status, but Lord, our, our, our value is found in being known and loved and created by you. Both created, redeemed, what a wonderful truth that is. So as we, as we wake up every day, Lord, maybe we be reminded of that. As we face whatever the world is going to face us with, Lord, may we know who we are because of creation, Lord, but also because of redemption, because of your cross, because of your resurrection. But may we know who we are in light of your return and what that means for us. And however many years you give us on this earth, Lord, may we not only live with that knowledge, but may we share that knowledge. We say, Holy Spirit, go with us. 
Remind us not just who we are, but help us remind those. Help us reconcile people. Help us introduce people into this story of who they are and the purpose and the role that they have within it. Lord, may the world come to understand that in God's forgiveness and salvation, they will find their value and their worth. Lord, we ask and we pray as we go from this place. Holy Spirit, go with us. Continue to speak to our minds and to our hearts. Encourage us when we are discouraged. Give us strength, Lord, when we are weary. Not every day is joyful, Lord. Not every day is happy. There's all sorts of things we face. But as your Spirit goes with us, remind us who we are and who it is we belong to, Lord. As we see people in this world, Lord, give us the courage Open our eyes to those who are hurting, to those who are lonely, to those who struggle with their own worth. Lord, may we get to speak hope and life and light into their lives. Lord, may you bring someone into our life this week so that we can speak into. It's no easy task, and so Holy Spirit, go with us. We ask and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.